Good morning, Professor Ambukpella. So we are meeting for the second time because I thought we will discuss your article, Decolonizing uh, Education, a few critical thoughts also in English. Now, originally I had meant to simply talk about it in Sinhala because it's available as an English article. But then I realized that when I talk with you, there are various other aspects that you bring into this uh, article and it's generally very interesting. And it may be that those who missed reading it might learn something just by this discussion. So I have uh, revised my decision to only have Debasa in Singhala. And I thought I will have a parallel article uh, discussion with you in the English language as well. So what we do here, like what we did for the Singhal article is, I ask you about what you have discussed in this article, which I discussed about a month back. So anyone who wants to see what we I explained in Singhala can do so. Here I will talk, question you on some of these things so that you can discuss more on particular issues, which will help all of us expand our education and knowledge about our own history, specifically in connection with colonialism, right? So to start off the interview, this is about Harshana Rambukwala's, Professor Harshana Rambukwala's article, Decolonizing Education, a few critical thoughts, where he in a way gives a corrective to the absolutely anti-colonial feeling that some of us have towards what happened, which leads us to try and extricate the field of education from what the colonials did, what the colonizers did, right? And Harshana's first paragraph is admitting that he completely understands why there is a movement to take education away from what the colonials had set in place or planned. Professor Rambukwala, so the first question to you is, why is education so important to be moved from colonial thought? And what role did education play in the colonization process to make it so potent a field of uh, power? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Madhu, and good morning, and thank you for inviting me as well again. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Decolonization and education has been a long-standing topic in social sciences and humanities research and scholarship. Uh, the reason is particularly with regard to British colonialism, the colonialism that we experience. Uh, that was the that was the period in which a systematic education system was introduced to the country. What we call, would call a modern education system. This is not to suggest that education did not exist in pre-colonial times. Obviously it did, we had a highly developed Pirivena system, for instance, in the Sinhal and Buddhist community. And I think there were parallel systems in the Tamil community as well, right? But what we understand as a modern education system today with schools and examinations and performance indicators and all of that kind of, uh, kind of technology of it, education is something that comes with British colonization. And the world over, uh, British colonialism used education as a means to create the ideological conditions uh, that would enable them to govern more effectively and favorably. Uh, and one sort of the pop, one of the sort of most popularly known things is that they wanted to create an intermediate class of locals who were essentially black in skin, but uh, white in sight. So black skin, white masks is also the title of a book by uh, you know, the very famous post-colonial scholar or who's considered a post-colonial scholar now, Franz Fanon. Uh, it was also called the, sorry, Sahar it was also called the Comprado class, right? Yeah, Comprado class, yes. Comprado class, yes. Comprado yes. class, yeah. So it's, it's like a collaborative class that would allow, uh, like form like a middle layer in the colonial administration, allowing the colonial uh, 
uh, administrators to deal with the local population. So that was the intent of that education system. And there are different terms for this depending on the different culture. Some people call them coconuts, brown on the outside, white inside, or bananas, yellow on the outside, white inside. So different cultures have evolved different ways of naming this. I mean, it's also a rather pejorative kind of term, you know, the sort of demeaning kind of term. In Sinhala, uh, it will be something like Kalu Sudda, right? Yeah. In Sinhala, uh, what, what exactly does Comprado mean, Harshina? What's the definition of that term? Comprado, I can't remember the specific definition, but it essentially means a class of people who serve the economic interests of colonialism but come from the local society, right? Uh, but I think it has a more specific meaning. I, I, forget, I forget what it is, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so education, therefore, was a site of, uh, you know, what uh, sociologists would call ideological reproduction, or you, you, you introduce certain kinds of ideas and, uh, and then, you know, you transmit them at a very broad level into society. And there's also, it goes then from generation to generation as well. So education is a very powerful site that way to reproduce dominant ideas. And that has been recognized the world over. So, so given that when our countries became independent, education was an obvious place to start the decolonization agenda. So education was a place where decolonization needed to happen, right? Uh, so, so yeah. So that that is the I think I think the response to your question. Uh, you are muted, Madhu. Because I'm outside and there are birds. And babies and cats. I'm, yeah, I'm so really... I didn't catch the first part of that. <laughs> okay. Could you, since you talked about ideology, just refer quickly to the, you know, the instruments of ideological reproduction in the very famous article, which I will um, talk about very quickly. And also, sir, you know, education is very much a part of what he calls the ideological reproduction, right? Could you quickly refer to that also, since this, this interview is to get general public also? aware yes. of some so, of the important ideas. Okay, so I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, you know, talks about what he calls ISAs or ideological state apparatuses. Uh, these are institutions within society which allow dominant ideas to infiltrate into the social system. So one of them is education. Uh, and there can be many, many other means of uh, in, in, in which they happen and Sort of, I mean, Althusser's theorization happened uh, in sort of, you know, the mid 20th century. Now our societies have changed. So there are different institutions and different vectors or different means through which these kinds of ideas spread. But uh, more or less, I mean, if you look at the media, if you look at uh, education, uh, even if you take the law as an institution, these, all of these tend to reproduce ideas that are. The, the, the majority, the dominant system of belief in a society. And uh, that is also tried to class interests as well, because those ideas tend to be formed, controlled, and policed by a class which has a certain kind of capital and uh, monetary power in a society as well, or economic power in society as well. Exactly. You can't, uh, you can't take away class or economy from any of these discussions that we do at the theoretical level. Yes. So you, the, you, while starting it, you have said education is therefore very necessary to be discussed if you are talking about moving away from, um, away from the ideology they try to give us, right? My question then, Professor Ambukwala, is did Sri Lankans ever, I mean, of course, there were discussions about the need to move away. Did we systematically do anything to dismantle our education system from what the col colonial people decided it should be? As far as I know, the school system is still the British system, right? Did we do anything radical in a way in which we broke away from what they tried to do to education? Yeah, so if the question is whether there was a systematic decolonization process, the answer, the short answer is no. Uh, the curriculum, 
uh, even to some extent the content of what we taught remain the same and the structure because see we have to also understand this in broader sort of political economy terms because the structure of the nation state is something that we inherit from colonialism we don't sort of you know dismantle that and completely restructure and create a new kind of political society after colonization we what we are given we continue so so it's the same structure but the people who occupy positions of power change i think nanda malni has a song i think kodi aape kodi gaha honge Uh, which means you know the flag is ours but the flag pole is still there so in some ways the the form of the nation state remains the same so so it was with education as well but uh, professor i'm going to again interrupt you because of the importance of the word nation yeah. right given that we are fighting over it that that is one of the prime signifiers of what's happening in the current world we might forget that that concept itself was from the west that the nation itself was a pretty recent 18th century or you know after that development so what we are actually considering absolutely our past is a, a very recent concept which, which the west gave us which we are projecting backwards since we have uh, approached that word maybe you could talk a little bit about that as well yeah so i mean uh, these are also very uh, i mean nation and nationalism and nation state three distinct terms uh, the idea of nation some scholars would argue is is pre colonial and dates from far back in history so there are actually two sort of schools of scholarship on this one is what is called the primordial school of nationalism they believe that ideas of nation and nationalism are very old and then there's the modernist school and they they mark a radical break in the 19th 20th century and that this is a new phenomenon but uh, either, so the so the uh, the other group is are the equating nation with kingdom not necessarily so anthony d smith is the big name associated with this the primordial line of scholarship uh, what they argue is the consciousness of belonging to a larger wider community like a nation is something that is visible throughout history so for instance if you take uh, the jews are uh, like a prime example in european history of a nation without a state because all the way from biblical times you can see them imagining themselves as a community but they don't have a territory to call their own Right, so then there are the multiple exodus as the scattering. You know, the term diaspora comes from the Jewish experience. It is the scattering of the Jews across the world, uh, and then of course the Israeli nation state is created at the end of the Second World War, partially resolving the question of the Jews, but creating a new problem by essentially minoritizing the Palestinians. in their own territory because they they then become the minority that new jewish nation state but to go back to the question so but even the primordial scholars would agree that as you rightly said the 19th 20th century marks a point where the idea of the nation and the nation state undergoes very radical changes right uh, to give a very simple example if you think of sri lanka at pre colonial times nobody carried an identity card nobody had a birth certificate right so once you are given an id card then that id card says that you are uh, that this is your name this is your ethnicity this is your religion your birth certificate they they become codified they become institutionalized in ways that was not uh, that was not the case before right and they are given also kind of a legal validity because if you think about it you know if you come from the muslim community in sri lanka a different set of legal uh, and even in terms of property ownership sometimes uh, you know your your ethnic origin matters now that was not the case necessarily the case before so you know ganarato besekara and other anthropologists have, anthropologists have written about this the the boundaries of people's identities were much fuzzier back it was not so clearly marked because simply because there were no structures to kind of you know 
say, okay, you belong to this community, you belong to this community. There was more cultural traffic between communities and Sri Lanka, we should not forget. And, and this is where I think we need to you know, rethink our island mentality. An island, you know, though we are an island and we are physically separated from the Indian landmass, there was a huge amount of back and forth traffic of people in, uh, throughout the throughout our history and, and there is archaeological evidence from Anuradha Pura, for instance, that a Nestorian cross has been discovered in Anuradha Pura. So there was some kind of Christian presence there. And if you go to Sigiriya, you will also see uh, archaeological evidence of Arabic influence, Chinese influence, etc. So this means that uh, uh, different kinds of uh, can we take a small break? I think uh, some. Yeah, Hashan, we can. Can you reconnect it? Uh, because there's a, I'm sorry, I, this guy has come to get a letter. Yeah, let him come. That's fine. If I switch it off, I can't upload it in one. Okay, so I'll just uh, switch off the video. Drop the camera. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll continue. So excuse Professor Harshan, because we are all working within our institutions where he's also the director of the Postgraduate Institute of English. So um, one of the interesting things of having a discussion with the writers that I do now is that I can also ask them to, sometimes writers who just say something, but there's a whole lot of knowledge, whole lot of reading behind what they say. So when I, through Debasa, another thing that I'm trying to do is that I get them to explain what they assume we knew so that Always it's a very interesting process because especially with academic writing, oh, this is not quite academic, this came in a, a newspaper article, but you can never express everything that you want to say in an article. So when I get a chance to talk to the original writers, and that's what I'm doing in Debasa, if they are willing to come, I take what they say and I ask them, what made you say it? And there's so many, as you could see with Professor um discussion, there's so much more that you can learn. So that is one of the reasons why I thought I will do this in English as well. It's very interesting. So after this uh, first paragraph, you're still within the first paragraph, then Harshana goes up, Professor Rambukwella goes on to talk about what the colonizers did to our own systems of knowledge. Right, I had explained this in Sinhala, but I never got a chance to explain that article in English, so I can use this time for that. The second paragraph, he particularly talks about Macaulay, Thomas Babington Macaulay, um, who actually said that the, all of the Eastern knowledge, if you take India, he actually was referring only to India, mainly to India, all the Sanskrit, all those knowledge in every library. If we collect the Eastern knowledge, it will equate, he said, one good shelf of English books. So that kind of arrogance, that kind of sweeping statement hasn't really helped us feel good about ourselves, nor has it helped the positioning of Eastern knowledge within the global context. And this is another reason why most post-colonial theorists or intellectuals fight against what the colonizers did, right? You might also have heard this phrase, post-colonial theory, in which there is a writing back, a fighting back of how they regarded us. And a very good example is this Macaulay. If you read Gauri Vishwanathan's uh, Masks of Conquest, she actually, discusses education specifically with regard to how the colonial ideology was passed on to us. Because uh, Harshan, if you are ready, I'm uh, just come back. Uh, because what happened is through education, we ourselves got the ideology that the British people had of us. So that we were looking at our own selves through their eyes which wasn't very complimentary to us. So Harshana's second paragraph is very much about how the, um, the policymakers of colonial Sri Lanka or India were very negative towards 
but the knowledge we already had. And that kind of feeling of inferiority, once we know that we have got it, our instinct is to fight back, to say no, right? And one of the things, while he admits that he understands this kind of reason to fight back, he also cautions us against what can happen when we go to an extreme position in the fighting back. Okay, so that is why his whole article is named A Few Critical Thoughts. Okay, so Harshana, during your absence, I spoke about your second paragraph, okay. where you say that you can completely understand why people fought and you have given uh, Macaulay as the uh, example. Just so I, I also referred to uh, Gauri Vishwanathan's Masks of Conquest and you know, where she expounded on what you very shortly say here. Can we then go back to the second paragraph where you say it's justifiable that we should have a need to fight back? Yeah, so I mean, uh, one of the things that uh, colonial systems of education did was uh, in many ways marginalize and uh, uh, devalue local knowledge uh, at, at a large scale. So, and a huge amount of indigenous knowledge that was available in our societies was lost in a way due to this process and, the, and was not able to gain any legitimacy within the education system. So, for instance, many of our beliefs are marked as superstition yeah. and dismissed with very little study. And I think you already spoke about Macaulay. So Macaulay's sort of infamous minute on Indian education where he claims that one shelf of a good European library is more valuable in terms of knowledge than uh, you know, all of what has been written in the classical Eastern languages like Sanskrit, for instance, right? So there was a certain kind of intellectual arrogance and there was obviously then therefore a need to regain some legitimacy for what was local. Uh, and in terms of, uh, I mean, another very important aspect to decolonization was that uh, primarily because we were colonized by the British, English was seen as the medium of modernization and the medium of uh, science, the medium of rationality, the medium of developing these countries. Uh, so this is even evident if you go to Sri Lanka in 1833 to the Colebrook Cameron reforms, uh, the Cold Book Cameron reforms proposals English as a means of modernizing uh, Sri Lankan society. But the problem there was the, though English medium education was introduced to the country, uh, there was a parallel system. There were the vernacular schools as well as the English medium or the Anglophone schools. And the Anglophone schools were a very elite minority. So it was only a very, very small segment of the Sri Lankan, something like 2% or less of the total uh, population that was being educated had access to English language education. Yeah, uh, Professor Ambukpala, this is something I want to draw attention to because one of the ways in which we look at 1956 is to say that through the Singhala only act, English was taken away from the common people, right? But I also always feel that's not quite the case because who we call the common people or the people without much wealth, which is a majority of us, were never having access to English anyway. It was a fee-living, elite, wealthy people who were being given uh, English education, and it never passed. It did it ever pass to a non-fee-living school? Uh, In again, Jaffna, did it pass to non-fee-living schools? Uh, I think Jaffna, the case was maybe a little different because American missions, particularly. Uh, really broad-based English education. And That's I think a bit it was different, perhaps I think. more mm -hmm. widely available in Jaffna. Again, I, I don't, I can't go into the historical specifics because I'm I, not very really Yeah, I think about... it was because I was, I was doing some research with Santan about, you know, his upbringing and English education was more widely available in the north part of the country because of the American missionaries. Yeah. It wasn't quite the case in the south, I think. And yeah. there, what you say applies very much. Yeah. So I think, I mean, uh, the necessity to switch to the local languages or to the vernaculars was very much a felt need. And again, you don't have to go very far. If you look at uh, Leonard Wolf's, uh, you know, that they village in the jungle, that critical scene in the story where Silindu 
is being sentenced and the judge who is essentially wolf himself in a way recognizes that justice is not being served and that the interpreter Mudali or the Tolka Mudali is actually twisting the evidence uh, in favor of the Mudalali, but uh, the judge is helpless to intervene. Uh, so, so in a way, it's a, it's a moment where colonial justice fails and that is due to the medium, uh, due to language. So therefore, the, the switch to the local language in 1956 was certainly necessary. But there were two, at least two negative outcomes which could have been avoided had we had a more enlightened discussion uh, at that point. One, of course, in the 1940s, when the first uh, proposal was brought to the state council, the legislative council, to, uh, to change the official language in the country, it was for both languages, for Tamil and Sinhala. Uh, and there was broad based support, both from the Sinhala political elite as well as the Tamil political elite for this at that point. Uh, in fact, uh, it was only, uh, you know, J.R. Javad, who later became our first executive president, he, of course, took a stance from the outset that no, Sinhala should be the only official language because it's the language of the majority in the country. But uh, even SWRD Bandar Naika, who eventually is the person who uh, enacts this legislation in 56, up to 1955, uh, actually backed Sinhala and Tamil parity status. It was only also, in 50, yeah. also, is it history? I have read that the first call for native language education actually came from a Tamil student uh, movement. That they were the ones who said native language. They did yeah. not specify Tamil or single, but said native languages. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I think the legislative, the first motion in the legislative council was also by a Tamil politician. Again, I forget the name, which is one of the more prominent Tamil politicians at the time. Yeah. So I think that was where one failure occurred. Was where we elevated one the language of the majority to official language status at the expense of an important minority language and that we know the outcomes of that very clearly in the tragic post-colonial history of this country. Uh, so that was one issue where we got it wrong. The other was the, that though the switch to the local languages was done, English continued to have, play a very influential role, largely unseen in a way. Uh, at the upper levels of governance, because govern, at, at the upper levels of government, English continued to wield a huge amount of influence, and it also uh, still had a lot of what we call social and cultural capital. Who had English, who had that kind of so social influence, uh, and we failed to broad base English education, and that situation continued right up to the 70s, and in 1978 when we switched our economic model to a more sort of a neoliberal open economic system, uh, those who had had access to English were in a much more advantageous position because with the uh, inflow of neoliberal capital and uh, the, the sort of the rapid expansion of the private sector and the coming of multinational companies, etc., those who had English were at a distinct advantage compared to those who only operated in local languages. So, so, so actually, actually, from Rambukwala, the power of the English speaking elite had never diminished, no, no matter what happened. No, from, from whatever 95, whatever happened, that power remained, yeah, right, even up to now, yeah, yes. So, okay. I mean, right now, I think the situation is very complex. Uh, I don't know whether we should go into that because the, the political, the structure of the political elite in the country begins to shift. Yes, I think, I, I, think, yes, yes. I think we should leave the political elite out of our general term elite, yeah. maybe the social elite. Yeah, yeah. yes. And, and also, I think English has become more egalitarian. I mean, there is far more receptivity today to different accents. Uh, what we used to mark as, you know, broken English again, a very problematic term. Uh, I think now people feel much more confident and I, I and even through anecdotal evidence, you see it in the university, you see it in other sort of uh, private sector organizations, etc. People are more comfortable 
in articulating themselves in English, even though you know certain kind of linguistic judgments might hold that as you know wrong English or mispronounced English or whatever. So I think in that sense the space has expanded; it has become more democratic in a way. But I think there is a long way to go. And and the other question we need to ask today is whether the emphasis we place on English is misplaced to some extent, because English does not in its own guarantee social mobility. There are many, many other factors uh, within our education system, etc., that are required. So English alone and also with the, with say China emerging as a very strong global superpower, uh, is English the only way to go for you know, perhaps, I mean, even just in terms of business opportunity, if you know Chinese, uh, you're at a major advantage. So you can, you can I think, Professor Ambukkala, that war is going to be, the war of language is going to be fought beyond Sri Lanka, beyond our borders, at a very international level at some point in the future. Yeah. Right? So, so, so when we look at the mix of languages that we teach our students and the linguistic policies that we want to implement in this exactly. country, yes. I think we have to take these geopolitical realities into consideration, right? Our investment in English was due to a certain geopolitical reality that existed for the last 60, 70 years, but that is rapidly changing. Now. So whether we want to continue on that line or whether we want to look at different futures is something I think we need to ask of ourselves. Uh, but yeah, to go back to decolonization, then yeah, English was maybe one of the failures in decolonization also because we we failed to unseat English from its position of privilege, and it continued to wield a significant level of influence in the country. Is it is it, is it just us or every post-colonial South Asian country? Did India succeed or did Africa succeed? Right. Africa is not South Asian, of course, but. Is it just specific, particularly Sri Lankan problem, or is that a problem of generally post-colonial countries? What do you think? I think it's a general problem, but perhaps there are local nuances that are slightly different. So in India, if you look at it, the most of the educated elite are bilingual, far more so than in, in Sri Lanka. And then they have access to a number of the local languages, whereas in Sri Lanka, sort of monolingual English speaking elite are large in terms of number, but more or less the problem has remained. I mean, English remains a very powerful linguistic tool in a way, uh, and then and access to it grants privileges. So that is one area in which probably the decolonization agenda failed. And to sort of tied back to the article and what you opened with, uh, I think the, the fact that Sinhala was made the sole official language in 1956 is also a demonstration of how narrowly we have conceived decolonization and the problem. Because, because if we were talking about decolonization in a broader term, in fact, there were two terms in the Sinhala mainstream kind of jostling for influence in the 50s. One was what we call deshi or, or local or indigenous in a very broad sense, which could, and, and deshi was a term that could accommodate the Sinhalese, the Tamils, the Muslims and different communities. Uh, but the other term that also gains influence perhaps towards the later 50s and into the 60s is Apeka, which is a much more narrowly defined idea of uh, local. Yeah, Harshan, I'll be dealing with this concept of Apekama very much when I discuss your book, yeah. because that is about authentic Apekama. So I'm not going to yeah. delve deep into that concept now. But just something you said. So Deshiya actually meant all, all local people, is it? When it, you said Deshi? I think uh, it carried that meaning for a long time in the 50s. Deshi Yatya could me was able to, because if you look at, uh, you know, particularly elite political and cultural revivalist activity uh, in the uh, early uh, 20th century leading up to the 1950s, people from different communities participated in those projects. So there was much more space for that to happen. But then you see a gradual 
sort of if you like a singularization of uh, everything from the 50s on and then and, uh, you know a gradual erosion of that kind of multicultural diversity that you saw already. Professor Ambukpella, now because we also touched upon, I brought about like India and Nigeria, you, your, your next part of your article is giving examples from the African continent. And you specifically refer to Ngugi Watiango, you know, a very, very well known writer who took a, a stand which made him say, I will never write in English again. Can we just delve into what happened in a parallel post colonial, you know, Part of the world. Yeah, so I think, yeah, so that's the other thing I think many judge, if we want to judge historically, which scholars shouldn't do anyway, but yeah, but if you judge that historical moment in Sri Lanka, it was a part of a larger decolonizing trend across the world. And as you said, in Africa, uh, decolonization happens a little later, maybe a decade later to Sri Lanka. You have writers like Ngu Givatiango, Chinua Achade, uh, coming out very strongly, trying to sort of writing in English, trying to uh, create a sense of pride, the sense of uh, uh, value for their indigenous cultures. And, and Africa was particularly badly affected by colonization because they were oral cultures. They did not have a written script. They did not have written documents, which for many European scholars, a culture without a written tradition was not a culture at all. Uh, so, 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 South Asian countries like India and Sri Lanka were treated very differently to African cultures. Yeah. Uh, so, just to way. yeah, just to point that out. So, we had to fit into a mold that they had specified for us to qualify. Yeah. So, it's it's kind of for me apart from arrogance, is incredible stupidity as well. So whatever they did not consider to be knowledge, which in their sense was printed, the printed mm -hmm. word was not knowledge and it was all reduced to nothing, zero, right? So I, I can see that the African, you know, it's, it's probably savages with no kind of, uh, you know, yeah. culture in them. I can see why these people took their, uh, you know, the resentment and I maybe also the creative writers were some of the first to fight back you know, in yeah. things fall apart. You know, that little paragraph at the end where the colonial looks at the dead man and thinks, I have a feeling there's a history behind it, but he doesn't get it. And yeah. the whole novel is actually the unspoken history. So yeah. I think that the arrogance of considering anyone, if we do it, it's still arrogance. What we think is what qualifies yeah. is a hugely unjust, unjust thing to do generally about anything. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If we, we have anyone equally important as English writers or speakers who have taken this stand, uh, Professor Ambukwella, where yeah. we have said, we, we just do not want to deal with English. Yeah, in getting so up. writing in English, I think the major example is the poet Lakdasa Vikram Singh, who was actually an English language instructor at California University. Uh, very, very intelligent and very creative man who was also fully bilingual, as far as I know. Uh, he he didn't live very long. He died quite early. Uh, I think he drowned while swimming. Uh, 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 but I mean, he has this iconic poem called "Don't Talk to Me About Matisse," uh, where he he talks of sort of European high culture and the modernist artistic movement as a form of cultural exploitation, if you like, because the subjects of say Paul Gauguin. Or uh, or Matisse, or you know, Van Gogh, or many of these sort of modernist painters uh, painted scenes from, say, African culture, etc. And he sees that as a form of sort of cultural uh, theft, if you like, in a way, and then a culture, a cultural appropriation, while silencing the violence of colonialism. Uh, because in the same poem, he talks about how they came to our villages and splattered our huts with the uh, bullet fire or something. I can't remember the exact line. So, so, so the two, the disjuncture between the two, because here is this sort of wonderful aesthetic product, but underlying it is this 
violence, violence of the colonial encounter. And thereafter, he yeah he also made a statement that he was not going to write in English, uh, which is very similar to what Ngugi does in the African context. Uh, he says we should not further enrich the English language, which is the language of the oppressors, etc. And we should instead focus on our local languages. But the irony, though, of that moment, I mean, that is done in a kind of a sense of sort of decolonizing fervor and sort of a very passionate political moment. But Ngogi actually does continue to, his books are continue to be available in English. And I don't know whether he himself writes the Kikuyu version and English version or whether he gets somebody else to translate, but the books continue to be available. And uh, even in the case of Lakda, so he does continue to write in English. And, and that is where I think the question of what I addressed in the article comes about, uh, whether we have the luxury or whether we can actually disown what has come to us from colonialism whether it's the English language, whether it's the way we dress, the way we eat, or the systems of knowledge through which we look at this work, can we actually get rid of them? Because, you know, colonization was not a, like a sudden moment that just disappeared. It was a long drawn out process which conditions generations of people's minds, systems of governance, education systems, etc. So unlearning all of that, is that realistic? And even is that necessary either? Right. Because, I think Professor Hamdra Bukpala, that is where your critical comments come. Yeah. So I like the way you have framed your article where you say, yes, you understand why education was primary to be moved away. Then you say, because we were looked down upon so much. And then this is where your caution comes in. There is a danger in that, right? And you have said this danger had been pinpointed much earlier by the very famous theorist, Franz Fanon that you spoke of and you know Richard of the Earth, can we just refer a little bit about what he said, uh, Professor Abukwala, about this process? Yeah, so Fanon has a chapter called On National Culture in Richard of the Earth, where he kind of envisions a certain kind of how a historical trajectory that uh, post-colonial societies will take. So he says immediately after independence, people will try, start uh, turning back into back to their history, glorifying history, romanticizing history. Uh, and in order for these societies to move forward, the, the post-colonial intelligence of those societies have to overcome that uh, romanticization and move beyond that. Because if they continue to do that, they will not see the reality of uh, the, the reality of their societies and remain trapped in the past. But unfortunately, I think what has happened in most societies, particularly in the cultural realm, even if you look at India, if you look at Sri Lanka, there is still this yearning for a lost past. Uh, it's, it's like what I would call a post-colonial culture of mourning. It's, it's like something very valuable has been lost to us and it is our task to somehow go and recover this. Uh, and then if you look at it's, it's all over our culture, it's all over our film, theater, everything. Uh, but but is, should we still be remain within that frame? Or should yes. we think of and you have things? given two specific examples of the dangers that such kind of nostalgia has, the creation of an idealized past. And the two examples you have given are very current showing also that these are not just theoretical musings. Yeah. It actually has a practical, sometimes extremely dangerous results on, on the ground at grassroots level. And one is your, your pointing out that during the pandemic, I mean, now, of course, we have the vaccinations and all that, but the beginning of the pandemic was marked by a very intense belief in our own original systems of medicine. Right now, I want to point to the fact that we cannot really now say even science is not ideology based, right? Absolutely. Even at, to some extent, it is. But at some point, I mean, you can't uh, like two and two makes four. There are some things that you might have to give, trust a little bit even as being more objective than the rest. And I think one clear field is medicine where you know you don't have space to fight because it's life and death yeah. right and 
granting that it can be ideological, the science also is a way of gatekeeping, a gatekeeping process, keeping some knowledge out. The danger of going to an ex extreme in that was made apparent before our eyes during the pandemic. Would you care to expand on that, President Mukwala? Yeah, so I think the danger of this kind of decolonizing thinking uh, is that it can be easily politically exploited, as it has been in Sri Lanka for a very, very long time, because you can create these notions of a romantic past uh, and, uh, and in a way sort of uh, suspend people's ability to critically think about their present by, by getting them sort of completely enmeshed in this sort of past imaginary. And as you pointed out, the during the pandemic, initially there, you know, this discourse uh, came about that uh, Western science in a way is failing to meet because vaccines were not developed at that point. I mean, we are talking about the say March, February, March, 2020, when the pandemic was just beginning to establish itself across the world. Uh, so vaccine development was at a very early stage and it looked as if Western science was struggling to find answers. And that opened up a space for not just in Sri Lanka, I think all over the world, for people to come and talk about, okay, maybe there are alternative ways of handling uh, illness and then and, and, and sort of, you know, medical issues uh, as well. And then maybe Western science doesn't have all the answers. I, I I have, I mean, I'm still sympathetic to that kind of discourse and discussion because that needs to happen. And Western science in itself is not a uniform entity. It has been fed by many different resources and there are all kinds of disputes, arguments about, uh, you know, what Western science is. But the problem is that then uh, completely sort of unproven, uh, some ideas that have no scientific validity, are allowed to gain sort of policy level, institutional level legitimacy in a country, uh, jeopardizing the entire medical system. And I think that is a very dangerous trend. Uh, and it is very sad that it happened in Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka has a very proud tradition of vaccination and public health management. We have a very, very, though we are a third world country, uh, economically, our health and development, human development indicators are some of the best in this region. And we have a very, very effective public health network and had that been mobilized properly. Uh, I remember we are a country that managed to eradicate malaria, uh, right? So, so, so in that context, I think uh, even, I mean, many in the medical profession were appalled at what was happening, but unfortunately these sort of very romantic ideas about decolonization, about indigeneity had managed to infiltrate the highest levels of policy making. And that I see as a danger. Uh, because yeah, yeah. Professor Ambukwell, that I think I'll signal that as well, because it was, it's everyone has a right to believe in what they want to believe. Like I myself have my own beliefs, which might be considered superstition or myth or whatever in a different part of the world. So I don't think either of us question that right. But I think what you're pointing out in this article and in what you say, it's when that becomes policy or institutionalized and given as fact and not just personal desire to believe in something. That's, I think, where the problem lies because we do not have to wholesale accept what the West had said is correct or not knowledge. But that's a personal decision. And you, you negotiate it between what you believe, what you want to believe very often for comfort. Those are negotiable, negotiated things. But whatever, whatever the state takes over or is put into institutionalized form, then we have to be careful that we don't take particular myths or belief as the objective truth. So I just wanted to signal that, which is again what you said. Yeah, and I think the real problem here is that uh, this mindset that holds that something local is always more virtuous of greater value than something that has come from the outside, one and the inside, because these two are not like compartments that are completely separate. Whatever we consider today as Sri Lanka, or Sinhala, or Buddhist, or Tamil, has been formed through multiple influences over 
a long period of time, right? We need to recognize that sort of indeterminacy about culture. There are no homogeneous cultures in this world. So there are no homogeneous knowledge systems either, right? So I think, so what we need to recognize is that we need to have a level of critical consciousness to know when an idea that is considered indigenous is being exploited politically for a different reason. Now, to give another simple example, there has been long discourses. Now, I think we can see that in neighboring India, it has happened in Malaysia. It has happened to some extent in Sri Lanka, for instance, that democracy, for instance, is somehow not suited to our societies. Because exactly. We and that is the second them. example you have brought in. The first example was a pandemic, the vaccination scenario. And the second example you give as a concept that sometimes taking an extreme precision of rejecting everything that came from the West as being bad can lead to some concepts like democracy also being challenged, right? And saying what we are used to is something like the monarchy or a kingdom. Okay, so I think the second example is what you're approaching right now yeah. in the discussion. Yeah, yeah. because that has enabled or popularly sanctioned very authoritarian type of leadership or authoritarian types of rulers to emerge in this region. And then I think we are living through, uh, in India, in Sri Lanka, in many of the other countries, we are living through the negative outcomes of that. So Because uh, uh, something in the history of us is, like you take the kingdoms, the Raja Kale things, you know, questioning or critical responding wasn't encouraged, no? Yeah. So the, what, what this kind of thinking can lead to is that, Professor Rabukwal, I'm going to lead you back into the university system or the, um, the, the, the system we are both in, right? This question of authority, of questioning, of actually asking, challenging people in whatever they are doing. We do not, do we encourage that in the education system as well? Because like, unfortunately, I do not find that now that even let's let's keep the state aside for a moment, but this questioning of power. So when you talk of power, even you and I are powerful within the classroom, the small context there, right? And one place where we can get give people that power to question authority, question power actually, is through the education system. But are we, because your final call in your essay is you say, do not go into extremes, right? Excuse me. I'm sorry, working outside means I'm handling a lot of other yeah, yeah. noises as well. Excuse me very much. So, uh, so what I'm saying is, Professor Rambukwala, what you said in the last part is that you're calling for, yes, this is necessary that we fight back, that we reject what they told us to consider ourselves, but do not go to extremes. So how do we know where to position ourselves? You said critical thinking. Critically analyze whatever you're given, whether it's from the West or the East, critically analyze what you're given to say whether it suits you now, given your particular context. Right. So this critical thinking ability, the, the ability to look at critical, look at critically at power, do we have? And I, I question the two of us also and all anyone considered in education, people have to learn a skill, no? But yes. do we give that skill within our education system? Yeah, unfortunately, again, the answer would have to be no, because our education systems and our own cultural makeup is in a way towards a very authoritarian style of knowledge production. Like we have that very sort of guru gola kind of dynamic in our classrooms, in even how we do assessments, allow very little space for students to bring in their own creativity, imagination, their own ideas, because the assignment itself is framed in a way to say, okay, there's a right answer and a wrong answer. So all of that needs to change. And, but one of the ideas, I see is we talk a lot uh, and multiple intelligences, etc. But I, it's talk. I don't see it actually being implemented in the system in any substantive way. 
Uh, and then I think it also has to start at the level of our cultural practices as well. I mean, in a university, do you want students to stand up when you walk into a classroom? Do you want them worshiping you? Why would you encourage them? Because these are adults. These are you know people who can be thrown in jail if they have committed a crime. They are they are legal adults in the country, so treat them like adults. Uh, right, and I'm I'm horrified. Sometimes I teach postgraduate students, and I have people who are far older to me getting up uh, when I walk into a classroom, and, and I I try to change it, and I don't know maybe, and, and that's why I think I think we have to be deeply self reflexive as well. I may be saying this verbally, but in what I do, maybe I'm encouraging that kind of behavior because I have been, unfortunately, I have also, I'm also part of this culture and I can't really escape that. I think initially when I moved back from Hong Kong, uh, I lived there for almost 10 years, I was different uh, because of that exposure. But I think very soon, in two or three years, I went back to sort of behaving the way any other Sri Lankan academic would. So, because Professor Rambukpala, we are all part of a cultural context. Yeah. I don't think either of us can. So for example, among the few people I would go down on my knees for would be my teachers in school. I mean, I would still do that. Yeah, that's a that's different context. context. So, yeah, yeah and, and there is no reason to be not proud of that also. Yeah. Like, like how I ended my conversation with you in Singhal, I told you go duck ping, yeah. which is a completely cultural, religious thing to say. So the reason I have named this um, my channel, the in-between space, is to show that you know you can get the best of both worlds. It's not to throw away everything that is Western, nor throw everything that's cultural. You take what you think is good. And so you think is so subjective that maybe critical thinking helps. Yeah. Right? So that is, I, I think, the point you also make. So how does critical thinking improve? Education, definitely. But most definitely, school education is not a place where you're learned to, where you're taught to question. Yeah. But at least tertiary education can be. Yeah. And maybe we can take a step towards that direction because tertiary education should not be a continuation of school. No. If the students challenge us, we will update our own knowledge yeah. and not just simply take notes of what we say. Yeah. Right? I think things have got really comfortable. They, we say, they write, that's it. And in a way, I mean, that model doesn't even work now because, you know, if you are producing outdated knowledge in a classroom now, a student has a device which can question that knowledge in a matter of seconds. You just Google it and you know that the teacher is, doesn't know what he or she is Exactly, talking. which which is for the good because that will keep everybody, all of us on our toes as well. But then the student has to be taught that he can do it and that he has a right to question. Yeah, no, and also the teacher needs to, I think, adjust his own positionality in the classroom or he or she to understand that you know, you're not like the font of knowledge, but what you can do is in a way guide your students in a sort of a way in sort of judiciously understanding which kind of knowledges are more valid than others, what are the kind of questions you should be asking. It's, yes. it's not because we are in this fact culture also. If somebody tries to fact check me, I will fail because I'm not very good at remembering facts. Uh, and I don't see exactly. It and no, no mm -hmm. is education a process of memorizing facts. No, that's what we have to remember. Yeah. So I, I think, yeah, that's a broader question of what education is, which I will be dealing yeah, with later. You know, which, which is a different topic. But since you ended this uh, article by saying what you call for is not a extremist position, but an ability to critically analyze whatever you are getting. Yeah. Right. And I, I thank you, Professor Rabupal. I'm going to end by saying this position of the middle ground, the in-between space. I think we should look at how we can empower that and make people feel comfortable between worlds without feeling traitorous to, some people feel that the middle ground, to be in the middle ground is to be traitorous to yeah. your own culture. Yeah. And that may be an extremist position yeah. because there could be many things which are not quite okay there. While as everything Western should not be worshipped and taken either. There could be many things wrong there. Likewise, there could be many good things in both. So in a way, I'm kind of a simplistic idea, <laughs> romanticizing this. But technically, no, you need that critical analysis, which I would say you can get through education, hopefully. You can get through reading. Now, reading is one place where without the med medium of anyone else coming into the middle, you can access some knowledge. And as Professor Abukwela said, it's, it's available on the phone now. It's no more 
just the elite who has uh, you know access to it those some still are so i'm going to do next month professor in february a small series called uh, alternative spaces for education just to show make them aware how accessible knowledge is now so hopefully we can get into these things also within that framework but today what i did was discuss this particular article in which you showed why you understand why decolonization should happen then you went on to say it's important that it happens because we've been made to feel so inferior within the colonial power structures of you know intellect and education and knowledge and then you said but be careful because if you by drawing back if you go to one more extreme you can then take anything that is ours like ape the ape karma as being good all the time and that can have practical repercussions in your real life which can be dangerous like not questioning authority or not believing in western science or medicine right and you ended the article by saying all you're asking for is a crit ability to think critically to judge critically that we know how to handle all the forces that we are caught in so did i kind of summarize it properly professor was yeah, that yeah, I think so. yes. kind of okay so thank you very much in your absence i explained to them why i talked to the writers because writers say something and there's a whole lot of knowledge behind that one sentence. Right. But by coming to speak with me, I can then yeah, untangle and, and that. Fact, yeah, I mean, there are, and, particularly when you put it in a newspaper, there are space constraints. And many absolutely. And I'm so grateful that you took the time and you were concerned enough to come and explain many things that you may not have because simply because you can't speak about all that. But to a discussion like this, we have time to talk about. I'm extremely grateful, Professor Abukfella, for your time and for coming here. I will meet you again when I talk about this book, which um, you know, I'm, which I'm trying very hard not to simplify. And it's a YouTube channel, so it has to be short. But the general idea, I hope I will carry. And I will see you then. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much for inviting me.